Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle them in the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray, O God, let us instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost. Grant us by the gift of the same spirit that we may be truly wise, and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. St. Pius X, St. Isidore, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. All right, so today we continue with the sacrament of extreme unction. Uh, we're going to consider the form of the sacrament, um, along with the subject and the effects of the sacrament, among other things. After having finished last class talking about the matter of the sacrament, we saw the holy oil uh, that is used, the oil of the sick. When we look at the form of the sacrament and the ritual, we're going to look, look at what, what takes place during the sacrament. We're going to see something that is mentioned by the catechism. That is, there, there are more prayers in this sacrament than any other. Um, so there's there's a lot of prayers. I was going to sneeze, but... Um. And the reason is, says the Catechism, is because those who are dying are most in need of prayers. But this is the supreme hour when you're dying, um, and you're getting ready to meet our Lord. There is a lot at stake. Mm -hmm. The dying are often struggling because they're facing this fearful thing, which is death. And none of us have ever faced death. Perhaps some people have faced death in the sense that maybe they've gone to the hospital or maybe they were like Dostoevsky, <clears throat> who was um, condemned to death. And he was, he was in a, literally in a line for, for a firing squad. And they were going along the line. They were like shooting this guy, shooting this guy, shooting that guy, you know. Um, and... All of a sudden, this this uh, guard appeared with with a pardon from the czar, or the, the, like a reprieve from the czar, and so he didn't get shot. But I mean, can you imagine standing there, thinking, you know, in a matter of ten seconds, I'm going to be dead. Um, so having to face death, and those who are at the end of life, that's that's what they're having to face. So they I'm going to pass from this world, and it's. Um, you know, we're, we're, depending on who we are and the habits we've established, um, our character, we're, we're all going to, to face it in, in our particular way, according to our, our virtue, what it, whatever it may be. So it is, it is a, a really crucial moment for all of us, and we really need the support of others at that point. Um, we, we need our, our loved ones around us, and, and we need prayer. And, of course, the devil is, is really... He understands how important that moment is. So the devil is really going to be attacking the dying. He, he really wants to go after the dying. Um, so this is why the church makes there to be so many prayers in the sacrament of extreme unction. Um, <clears throat> here's what the catechism says. There is no sacrament, the administration of which is accompanied with more numerous prayers and with good reason. For at that moment, more than ever, the faithful require the assistance of pious prayers. All who may be present, and especially the pastor, should pour out their fervent aspirations to God and earnestly commend to his mercy the life and salvation of the sufferer. So it's, it's good for us to take time out when our loved ones are dying, um, to, to spend time with them. Sometimes the doctors will say, so and so has two weeks to live, or, or whatever. But um, to to try to spend time uh, to be around them, to help them keep up their spirits, to help them see uh, de death in a supernatural perspective, to prepare their soul, to pray with them, you know, to help get them ready. Um, it's a very beautiful thing to do. Church, besides the sacrament of extreme unction in, in, the, in the Roman ritual, she, she has all these prayers to be said at, at the time of dying. And she has all these recommendations, even exhortations, um, that appear in the, in the ritual for those who are dying. All right. So let's consider the form 
of this sacrament. And you know, by the form, we, we mean the formula, the formula. That's what we're talking about the matter and the form. The matter is the, the stuff that is applied to the recipient. The form is the formula that is used to do the sacrament. And this sacrament is a bit unique in that the form is a prayer. It's a prayer. <clears throat> what do we mean by that? Um, we, what we mean is that instead of issuing a command, as is done in the, in the ordination of a priest, so the, the bishop imposed hands and he says, receive power from, from above, or instead of saying what is taking place, indicating what is taking place, like, I baptize you, I absolve you, I confirm you. That's where you say, this is what's going on, or this is my body. You know, a statement of, of what, what, what is going on. Instead of that, it, the form of this sacrament is a prayer. It's a request from God. Why is that the case? So it's not a command. We're, we're distinguishing the formulas for the sacraments. <clears throat> can have a command, um, a statement of what is being done, or, as I say, a prayer, a request made to God. And that is what is taking place in the sacrament of extreme unction. The priest goes to anoint the senses of the sick person, the eyes, you know, the ears, the nose, the lips. And when every time he does that, he says a prayer. He says, through this holy unction and his most tender mercy, May the Lord pardon thee whatever sins thou hast committed by sight or by hearing or by speech, depending on what part of the body he's anointing. So he's not saying, I anoint you with this oil or the remission of your sins. You know, like in confession, I absolve you from your sins in the name, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Right? Um, or I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Instead of that, he's he's praying to God. He, he's he's saying, "May this happen through the mercy of God. May this happen through this holy unction and His most tender mercy. May the Lord pardon thee whatever sins thou hast committed by sight or by hearing or whatever." Um, why? Why? Is it a prayer? St. Thomas gives three reasons. Why a prayer for EU, European Union, right? No, extreme unction. <laughs> no, down with the European Union. <laughs> um, so, why a prayer? St. Thomas says in the supplement, the part put together by his disciples from his previous works, first reason why he says why the form of this sacrament is a prayer is because the sick person is deprived of strength. and is in need of prayer. Um, he's deprived of strength such that he needs to be helped by prayer.
this is, this is uh, what I was just saying. I and mean, this, is, this is why we need to be near our loved ones when they're dying, because they need our support. They need our uh, support by our prayers, by our presence. Second reason, <clears throat> um, this sacrament is given to the dying who are in the, at the point of quitting the courts of the church and rest in the hands of God alone for which reason they are committed to him by prayer. So I'm going to rephrase this, this um, reason of St. Thomas, which is kind of formulated in old language. i to update it for the modern ears. Um, since the person is leaving this earth, And going to God, he needs to be commended to God by prayer. You know, we, we present to you so and so who is here is. is reaching the end of their mortal life, present them to you um, for you to, to, to receive um, into the heavenly court, to, to, to accept into your mercy. Then the third person, um, is, sorry, the third reason, the third reason um, why the form of the sacrament is a prayer, is because the secondary effect of the sacrament, the reception of health, is not always received. So if you know it's going to happen, um, then you use the indicative form. You say, I baptize you, I absolve you, I confirm you. But if some of the effects of the sacrament is left up to the dispositions of the recipient and the minister, it's better to put it in a deprecatory form. Um, the effect of this sacrament is not such that it always results from the minister's prayer, even when all the essentials have been duly observed. But that does happen with the character and baptism and confirmation, transubstantiation, and the Eucharist, remission of sin and penance. So, the secondary effect... <clears throat> of the sacrament the reception of bodily health does not always happen um, So, we do not use an indicative form. So, those are the three reasons that St. Thomas gives for the unique words that are used in, in the performance of the sacrament as opposed to the other sacraments. And this helps us understand what is going on um, in the sacrament, the context of the sacrament. All right. Then, <clears throat> then St. Thomas asked the question of the fittingness of the form. Uh, so we, we said that the form is... Through this holy unction and his most tender mercy, may the Lord pardon thee whatever sins thou hast committed by sight or whatever. It, St. Thomas says, is this good? Is this a, a good way to perform the sacrament? Is this, are these good words to use? Should, should we be using these words? Um, of course, he's going to say yes. He's going to say yes. He's not going to say, oh, man, why are we using these words? This is terrible. Um, we need to change them. He's not a modernist, right? 
like everything must be changed. These, these words make no sense to us today. Um, and uh, they don't reflect uh, our reality, so we need to change it. Like, uh-huh, uh, no. No, he's not going to say that. He's not going to say that. He's going to say the form of the sacrament is good. It's well formulated, right? It's well formulated. He says, um, it, the, the form is good because it includes three things. It includes the sacrament, that which works in the sacrament, and the effect of the sacrament. Uh, okay. The form includes three things. First of all, the sacrament. <clears throat> Secondly, its effect. And thirdly, by whom it's accomplished, or what works in the sacrament. We indicate the sacrament by saying what's going on. Through this holy function. Then um, its effect pardon the thy sins and then what works in the sacrament God by by God's mercy so what we when we when we use the form of the sacrament we, we want to signify something. We want to signify the hidden reality of what's going on. That's what all the sacraments do, right? They signify a hidden spiritual reality. In baptism, we're signifying the washing of the soul. In confirmation, we're signifying the strengthening of the soul through the holy oils. In the absolution, we're signifying the wiping away of sins. What's going on here? We're signifying the wiping out of sin from the places where sin was committed or the organs by which sin was committed, that, that those places are being healed from sin. So if you get a cut on your hand, you know, you put the ointment right on the cut because that's the place it needs to be addressed. And... The church says, this person has committed sins, and we want to heal this person from their sins. So we're going to come in, Dr. Church comes in and says, we got the remedy here. We got a remedy for you, and we're going to wipe out your sins. Let's make your soul sick. And we're going to take the holy oils, the medicine, and we're going to put it on your senses, the places which are wounded, the, the places where you suffered injury. You suffered injury in your eyes because you used them to commit sin. You suffered injury in your ears because you used them to commit sin, you know, and so on. All these senses. So we put the, the holy oils on the places. And th this, is, this is the signification of the sacrament. We're signifying a spiritual reality by the priest acting like a doctor who comes in and puts medicine or healing remedy, healing ointment, on the places where the sins were committed. Um, and of course, the spiritual reality signified is that it's the soul that's healed from the sin uh, through this application. And when we, when we go to use words, when we go to speak about what we're doing, we want the words to correspond to that signification. And what St. Thomas is saying is the words do correspond to the signification. We're saying this is a holy unction, a holy oil, a holy remedy. 
and that God's mercy is working on the soul in order to remove the sins, to get rid of the sins. So the form properly expresses the spiritual reality that is behind the physical appearances of what we're seeing in the sacrament, right? And so we, we conclude that uh, the form does its job of specifying what's happening here. That's what the form is supposed to do in all the sacraments. It helps specify what's going on. What are we signifying by this ritual? We're, in this case, we're, we're signifying the healing of the soul from sin by a holy medicine. Okay. So now that we know um, about the form of the sacrament, how about we just go through what happens? What happens, you know, the ritual when the priest goes to the hospital or goes to your home in order to communicate, give the sacrament to the sick person. When the priest comes, I'm just going to get rid of this. The first things that he does, uh, the first prayers that he says, are not the sacrament. They're pre preparing the place. They're sanctifying the place. So this is a sacrament that's not done in the church, right? I mean, it's very rare that it would ever be done in the church. Maybe, maybe the person is, is really sick, but they're able to get to church and brought to church in the wheelchair. But normally speaking, the priest has to go out into the world in order to do the sacrament. And when he goes out into the world, the first thing he's going to do is he's going to sanctify the place where he goes before he performs the holy ritual uh, upon the sick person. Whenever the priest goes to your house in order to bless your house um, or to do a sick call where he's going to confer holy communion or when he's performing the sacrament of extreme unction, the first thing he does when, when he, he goes in the house, he says, Pax huic domui, peace be unto this house and to all who dwell, dwell therein. And he sprinkles. He sprinkles the house. He does the asparagus in the room where, where he is. Um, so the rubrics say, you know, the rubrics are the words in red to tell the priest what he's supposed to do, while the black words are the things he's supposed to say. So you see this, this book, it has red and black. Those are the two colors. The red tells the priest what to do. The black tells him what to say. Yeah. So priest comes in, peace be into this house, and do all who dwell herein. It then places the oil upon the table, invested in surplus and purple stole. He presents the crucifix to be devoutly kissed by the sick person. Thereafter, he sprinkles with holy water in the form of the cross, the patient, the room, and the bystanders, people who are there. It's sprinkled with holy water. Sanctify the room, sanctify the person, sanctify the people who are there. Saying the antiphon, Asperges me domine sopo et mundabo. Right, you've heard that before. You've heard that. That's, that's, that's of the sung mass on Sunday. It, they spare just at the beginning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, at that point, the extra the, the function, as I explained last time, is a sacrament that's done after other sacraments. If he's going to, to give sacraments, other sacraments, when he comes, Extreme action is going to be the last sacrament because it's the last anointing, right? That's, that's the, uh, the nature of the sacrament. So it says, if the patient wishes to go to confession, he hears his confession and absolves him. Then he addresses to him some pious words of consolation, and if time permits, briefly explains the power and efficacy of the sacrament. And also, if he gives communion... Um, he would give communion at that time. So, 
So then the priest says some prayers um, to bless the home. To bless the home. He is basically three prayers for the blessing of the, of the home. And as usual, you know, when, whenever there's a blessing, including when your articles are blessed, um, the, the ones that are put out there that are blessed on Fridays, right? The priest goes and gets a ritual out and he bless them, blesses them. Before he does any blessing, he's going to say a couple of beginning prayers. He says, Adjutorium nostrum nomini domini, qui feci cero materam, dominus obiscum ecum spiritu tuo. Every blessing, pretty much every blessing. That was, that's the, the beginning part. Then the priest says these three prayers. He says, let us pray. Along with our lowly coming, O Lord Jesus Christ, let there enter into this home unending happiness, divine blessing, untroubled joy, charity which is fruitful, continual health. Drive forth from this place the spirits of evil. Let thine angel of peace come hither and banish all harmful dissension from this house. O Lord, extol thy holy name and our esteem, and bless what we are about to do. Sanctify the coming of thy unworthy servant, the priest, for thou art holy, thou art kind, thou art abiding with the Father and the Holy Ghost through all eternity. Amen. Second prayer. Let us pray to our Lord Jesus Christ and beseech him to bless with his abundant benediction in this home and all who dwell herein. May he appoint over them a good angel as a guardian and assist them to serve him and to contemplate the grandeur of his law. May he turn away all powers that would harm them, free them from all anxiety and distress, and keep them in well-being within their home. Thou who livest and reignest with the Father and the Holy Ghost, God, for all eternity. Amen. So that's the second prayer. And both of those prayers concern the house, right? It's about blessing the house. Third prayer, let us pray. Hear us, O Holy Lord, Father Almighty, Eternal God. Deign to send thy holy angel from heaven to guard, cherish, protect, abide with, and defend all who dwell in this home through Christ our Lord. Amen. So three prayers for the blessing of the home. That's the way the ritual starts off. Um, so there's three prayers. For the blessing of the home and those who are in it, yeah. What I wanted to happen is, like at the end, you're like, "Father, this sacrament is really cool. I feel kind of sick. Can you give me extra emotion?" Yeah. I want extra emotion. <laughs> Can you come to my house? <laughs> How sick are you? Um, so, after these preliminary prayers to bless the house, then the priest begins the sacrament, the, 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 the prayers that properly pertain to the sacrament. And this is, uh, he starts off with the imposition of the hand. I was off with the imposition of the hand. You know, in the in the baptism, in the traditional rite of baptism, there are two impositions of hands. Those take place in the vestibule. And the imposition of hands is um, done in, in multiple sacraments. It's done in baptism. It's it's done in confirmation. It's done in the holy orders, of course. In the holy orders, it's the actual matter of the sacrament, the imposition of the hands. And it's also done in this in this sacrament. In baptism, it signifies, it, it, it's, there's all this work before the baptism to drive the devil away. And there's the exorcism to drive the devil away, and then the priest imposes his hand, they're kind of blocking the devil from coming back. Um, so the imposition of hand is kind of um, similar here. It's, it's to drive the devil away um, from the, the sick person. So the devil may not have any power. To block the devil. So the priest extends his right hand above the head of the sick person and says, In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, 
May all power of the devil become extinct in thee through the laying on of my hand and through the invocation of the glorious and blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, of St. Joseph, her illustrious spouse, <clears throat> and of all the holy angels, archangels, patriarchs, prophets, apostles, martyrs, confessors, virgins, and all the other saints. So one prayer to keep the devil away. Through the imposition of the hand, and the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Saint Joseph, and all the saints. Then <clears throat> the, uh, the priest proceeds to do the actual anointing, and this is where the sacrament actually takes place. So he, he takes the holy oils and he anoints first the eyes, then the ears, then the nose, then the mouth, then the hands, and then finally the feet. Um, the anointing of the six locations to heal those locations from sin, to heal the soul from the sins that were committed through these, these things. And if the priest comes to a crash site um, or for whatever reason the person is dying and there's not time to do the elaborate ritual, he can shorten it. Um, by just anointing the forehead or if if the body is is uh dismembered or something you know you can you can just shorten it by um i believe anointing the the forehead alone how do you how often practice well, it depends on the priest. Father McBride would do it more more than I would. Yeah, for me, I haven't. I've definitely done it several times, but it's not it's not too often. A lot of our traditional parishes are have a young demographic, um, so we might not do it as someone who a priest who would have like a a, um, a nursing home ministry or a hospital ministry. Those are the ones who would do it the most. The extent that these demands was beyond the community of St. Jude or Jesus Parish, and you have, it, is it still some, somehow prevalent among the, 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 yes, the people yes. of Denver? Do you have to do what, I don't know, who haven't practiced the faith for years and all of a sudden, they're about to... Uh, they know about the, the sacrament. Catholics know about the sacrament and would would ask for it. Oh, uh, I think we typically ask for it. Um, yeah, uh, but I don't know. I obviously think fewer people are getting it than in times past. But Father Fulton told me an interesting story where he was going. He, he did a lot. He's done a lot of uh, extra function, but... Because uh, he took good care of his of his faithful and was uh, in track of whether they were close to death or not. But he went to anoint somebody, and then there was this nun there who said, "Father, come quickly! My brother is dying." And her brother was a priest, so there wasn't even someone there for this priest to anoint him. He anointed this priest, and the priest died like shortly thereafter. I'm talking about like ten minutes afterwards, you know. So, and this this is different from the sacrament of the sick. No, it's the same. It's the same. Yes. Because you know this other one. Yes. Yes. You, you yeah, we covered that last week. That's right. Yeah. yeah. We covered that last week, but we were looking at names of this 
we were talking on the way home and we never said that, but what was the, what was the, the last rites? Last rites, Is, yes. Was that the name of this animal or what? So it's, the name of this is like, we call it, traditional Catholics call it extreme unction. So if you talk to any traditional Catholic, they'll call the sacrament extreme unction. And what I was wanting to do is just indicate what that means, because um, it's a little bit obscure. And it just means last anointing. But we, we also said the name was anointing of the sick and some of the others, but is the last rites this? this it's or? this and other things. So all the things that a, that a priest might do for the sick person. So if, if he hears his confession, he gives viaticum, the last communion. He, he gives the, the sacrament of extreme unction, and then he'll, he gives the apostolic blessing. These are all rituals. So all the whole yeah. body of them, yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, so then we have the six anointings. Eyes, ears, nose, lips, hands, and feet. And you know that if a priest is receiving the sacrament, then he's not anointed on the palm of his hand because he's already received the sacred the uh, the oil of the catechumens when he was ordained he received the anointing there so for the priest they it's done on the back of the hand it's on the back of, for for the lay people it's done on the palm of the hand the priest is done on the back of the hand yeah famous story about Talleyrand who was a terrible Bishop uh, during the in France at the time of the French Revolution before the French Revolution and he survived like every regime He was a chameleon. He would just say whatever anybody ever wanted. So so uh, if if it's the king He says I love you king. I love you king. If it's the revolutionary government. I love you revolution I love you revolution if it's Napoleon. I love you Napoleon. I love you Napoleon, right? So he saved his head um, and he, he didn't lead the best life but when the priest came to him to give him the last rites and extreme unction, uh, you know, and and started to go to the noise. He, you know, he started on, on the palm, and the time around was like, no, 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 you know, on the back of the hand. <laughs> so he still um, had some principles. He was called the limping devil. The limping devil? Yeah, because he was limping. Okay. He had a bad, he had a bad, <coughs> bad leg. Yeah. Yeah, not a good reputation. And by the way, John, the American actor John Malkovich, uh, played Talleyrand. Really? Yeah, I just, um, I just watched it with my son. <laughs> a TV series in Napoleon, an international production with John Malkovich, okay. the American actor, and he's just amazing. Really? A good French accent? No, he doubled, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> he's really good. <laughs> no, he's, he's the incarnation of of the Talleyrand. Old, he's an American actor that does okay. it perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. The man with the man with no principles whatsoever, totally craven cleric was Talleyrand. All right. So after 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 this, there these six anointings, the sacrament has taken place. So this is where the sacrament is is actually done. It's right there, and this is before the preliminary. And then after, there's some prayers after. And the prayers after are su were surprising to me. I mean, when, it, when, when I first started uh, doing this, this sacrament after being ordained a priest, I was like, what's going on here? It, we have the, the sacrament ends with three prayers. And what surprised me is that all three of these prayers ask for the restoration of health. They ask for the restoration of health. I'm like, wait a second. I thought this was, uh, this was about 
a spiritual healing. And it is about a spiritual healing because the main part asks for the remission of sins. And the, the prayers for the bodily healing only take place after the sacrament is over. So that's clearly secondary. That's the secondary effect that the priest is going to ask for after he's done the anointings. So here are those three prayers. Let us pray. Lord God, who did say through thy apostle James, Is any man sick among you? Let him call in the priests of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. This is another reason, reason why we're, the form is a prayer, because that's what St. James says. He says the priest prays over him, says a prayer. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick man, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he be in sins, they shall be forgiven him. Cure, we beseech thee, O our Redeemer, by the grace of the Holy Ghost, the ailments of the sick man or woman. Heal his wounds and forgive his sins. Deliver him from all miseries of body and mind, and mercifully restore him to perfect health, inwardly and outwardly. That having recovered by an act of thy kindness, he may be able to take up anew his former duties. Thou who with the Father and the selfsame Holy Ghost lives and reigns God forevermore. Amen. Heal him. It asks for the remission of sins, okay, but it also is very insistent about please heal this person so that they can get out of bed and get back to their job. That's, that's what this prayer says. It asks for Second prayer, let us pray. Look down with favor, O Lord, we beseech thee upon thy servant or handmaid so-and-so, failing from bodily weakness, and revive the soul which thou hast created, that reformed by thy chastisement, he may acknowledge himself saved by thy healing through Christ our Lord. Again, revive the soul, heal the soul. Third prayer, let us pray, O Holy Lord, Father Almighty, eternal God, in pouring forth thy plenteous grace upon our ailing bodies, thou dost encompass thy creature with abounding love. Wherefore, graciously hearken as we call upon thy holy name, and do thou raise him up, freed from sickness, and restored in health, by thy right hand, strengthen him by thy might, protect him by thy power, and give him back in all desired vigor to thy holy church, through Christ our Lord. So three prayers for bodily health. And that concludes the sacrament of extreme unction. Um, <clears throat> As we mentioned last time, this sacrament should only be conferred upon those who have a serious illness. It's for healing. Uh, this, this sacrament is for healing. And you have to be sick in order to be healed. You can't, you know, it's like if you have a cold or you have the flu or whatever, that's not a serious sickness. So the sacrament is for healing both of the soul and the body, and those who, upon whom it's administered must be sick. And they must be seriously sick. St. Thomas, he says, this sacrament is the last remedy that the church can give, since it is a, an immediate preparation for glory in heaven. Therefore, it ought to be given to those only who are so sick as to be in a state of departure from this life, through their sickness being of such a nature as to cause death the danger of which is to be feared. At the same time, this doesn't mean that we should delay the sacrament until the last minute. And the catechism goes through the dispositions that should be maintained by those receiving the sacrament. What, what, what is the best way to receive this sacrament so that you will receive the most from it, the, 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 the full measure of its effects? And it says, well, it's not when you're comatose. It's not when you've lost your mind. You know, uh, It's not when you're doped up on morphine. It, it is when you are alert and you're aware 
of, of what's what's happening to you. So I mean, like when when my mother was was diagnosed with dementia, and we knew it was going to kill her. Um, and yet, at the same time, we know it wasn't going to kill her right away. It's going to take some time. Um, I was just like, I, I need to give her, I want to give her um, the last sacraments before, you know, she completely loses her realization. And so I, I asked her if she would be willing to receive the sacrament. And she was very happy to, to receive it uh, while, while she still had her faculties to some degree. So... <clears throat> Here's what the catechism says. It is obvious that if the sacrament is administered while consciousness and reason are yet unimpaired, and the mind is capable of eliciting acts of faith and of directing the will to sentiments of piety, a more abundant participation of its graces must be received. Pastors should be careful to apply this sacrament when its efficacy can be aided by the piety and devotion of the sick person. So if the sick person is aware, I have this sickness, it's going to kill me. I want to have my soul pure before God. Um, and there, you know, the sacrament can be very comforting for people. You just, the priest notices uh, a, a sort of even a physiological change in them after this, the conferral of the sacrament. It's very comforting for them. They, they, they feel like, oh, I'm ready. Uh, I'm, I'm ready for God. Um, at this point, I've seen the priest, and um, the church has has prepared me for for my death. They're 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 more able to face death after this sacrament has been administered. So, if they're awake and they know that they're receiving the sacrament, and they're able to participate and to receive the sacrament with piety and devotion, it's all the more efficacious for their soul. It's so efficacious if, if the person is comatose. If, the per, if, there, if there's a wreck, the, per, the person's in the ICU, um, they're out of it, and the priest comes and gives the gives sacrament, it still works. But it doesn't have as much of an effect as, as if the person is aware. So <clears throat> the, uh, the priest is meant to dispose the soul by administering the other sacraments before extreme unction. So the, the priest is meant to prepare this person for the reception of extreme unction. Um, as I read in the ritual, he hears the confession, he gives Holy Communion, <clears throat> he gives maybe a little exhortation before the sacrament, explaining what the sacrament is about, especially that fact that we want to get rid of the last traces of sin from your soul so that you can go straight to heaven when you die. This is the purpose of the sacrament. I'm going to anoint you and apply the remedies of the church on the places which led you to sin, <coughs> the things that you use to commit sin. So we can heal those, those places, heal your soul um, from those sins that you committed through those things. Um, so this sacrament is administered by a priest why can't lay people administer the sacrament of extreme unction? You know, they have lay people coming, distributing communion all the time now. Um, but the, 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 the lay woman who comes to the nursing home to distribute communion can't give extreme unction, can't give the last rites, can't hear confession. Why not? Until next month. <laughs> may change. <laughs> well, that would be invalid. Invalid. <laughs> it said this morning that the church needed to change. Oh, yeah. I think we've had enough of that. So, the thing is that the, the lay people do not have the power to remit sins. This sacrament remits sins, and the power to remit sin was given to the apostles those who have the power of holy orders. And it's only by the mercy of God that um, lay people are allowed to administer baptism. Because there's only two sacraments that lay people can administer. Baptism and matrimony. Matrimony. 
because they confer the sacrament upon one another. But all the other sacraments <clears throat> require a priest. The Council of Trent says, If anyone says that the priest of the church, whom blessed James exhorts to be brought to anoint the sick, are not the priest ordained by a bishop, but the elders by age in each community, and that for this reason a priest alone is not the proper minister of extreme unction, let him be anathema. And in all these decrees of Trent, these cans of Trent, where they anathematize everybody, like they go on and on anathematizing people, <laughs> they're, they're responding to the teaching of the Protestants. And the Protestants said, oh, when, when uh, St. James is saying, bring in the priests of the church, what he means is the elders. Bring in the old people to anoint the old people. And not those who have been ordained priests. And... Trent says, let you be anathema. That's its response to that idea. Uh, this is not the proper teaching. That means, yeah, let you be condemned by God. Um, yeah, basically, let you be damned. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, the anathema was, was uh, originally from the Old Testament where uh, God commanded that cer certain things uh, that the Israelites took not be used by them. Like if they, if they conquered a town, there were certain things that were anathema, <clears throat> certain booty they were not supposed to take, and it had to be removed and destroyed. Um, that was the anathema. So the, the anathema was the things condemned by God. Yeah. So, is, so are the anathemas reversible? Like, once an anathema, like if somebody has committed something that would be anathematized, is it still forgivable by God? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. But the anathemas are not reversible in the sense that the church can go back on that. Mm -hmm. So, if you have all these canons of Trent that are saying, if someone does such and such, let him be anathema. I mean, church can't come along later and say, if someone says such and such, let him be blessed and, and praised. You know, the, yeah, that, that doesn't work. Um, you know, some people name their dog anathema. They're like, <laughs> anathema sit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so the last thing that we have to consider are the three effects of extreme unction. Um, what are the three effects of extreme unction? The, remit, the remission of sin. The remission of sin. And we're, we're going to double this up and also say the removal of the effects of sin. So one thing is to remove the sin and by that it's it's like confession so you you have um <clears throat> someone who is the state of guilt they have, they have the guilt they're a criminal and then god comes in and says all right i forgive you and then they're no longer a criminal we're restored to the public as not being a criminal <clears throat> that's what takes place in confession it also takes place in extreme unction um, especially for venial sins. So the catechism specifies this sacrament is not for the remission of mortal sins. That's not what it's intended for. It can indirectly remit mortal sins if someone, for instance, um, is not able to go to confession uh, because they're out of it, but they had the right dispositions beforehand. Um, this sacrament can remit mortal sins. 
So it especially remits venial sins, but then it removes also the effects of sin. There is a sickness of the soul. We have a certain level of vice in us. We have a certain level of tendency towards sin, inclination towards sin. Insofar as I've fed sin by committing sin, I have habits of sin, um, I have a routine of sin, I, my soul is sick. It's not healthy. It's not in the proper disposition. It's not virtuous. Mm -hmm. So extreme unction, and, and we're not ready to see God. We're not ready to see God to the degree we have this attachment to sin. And we're going to have to go through purgatory to get rid of, of those effects of sin. That the fact that it's made me into a warped person. Uh, I'm, I'm not oriented properly towards the good. I have this inclination towards evil and this habit of, of doing evil. And that has to be rectified. I have to be set straight before I can see God. And the sacrament of extreme unction is meant to help that, um, to help set us straight. So penance wipes out completely the guilt of sin, but it leaves us with our attachment to sin. And sometimes I sell this to people. I'm like, okay, you, you confess your sins and everything, but you have to understand you still have the attachment to sin. You still love sin. Um, you don't want to do it. You don't want to do it, but you still have that inclination towards it. And you have to work. In, in order to get rid of that. And I mentioned last time that um, extreme unction is supposed to step in and do some of that work for us. Whereas before extreme unction, we have to do that work ourselves. We have to pray, we have to do penance, we have to avoid the occasion of sin and so on in order to remove from us this affection for sin um, and this inclination for sin. So extreme unction is there to heal us from the infirmity that, that exists in our soul due to sin, restoring our soul to full vigor. And this comes at the right time, says the catechism, uh, because we're not, um, we, we're often fearful before death, um, and we need strength, we need to fight off the devil. So we're, we're being set straight, we're, 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 our soul is, is being rectified. Um, and we're stronger to face the devil at that point right? once our tendencies towards sin have been corrected. And then the third, the third effect is the healing of the body, the recovery of health. Recovery of bodily health which the Catechism says God gives when it will be of use to the subject, when it will be use, uh, spiritually useful. Sometimes the healing of the body will be spiritually useful. And the Catechism says, okay, it's happening less now. This is in the 1500s. It's happening less now than it, than it did in the past because there's not as much faith as there was before. There's not as much faith on those who receive the sacrament. There's not as much faith on, uh, on those who give the sacrament, the priest who give the sacrament. And it says to the people who are receiving the sacrament of extra unction, you should receive this with the same faith as the people who are being healed by the apostles. You think about the apostles coming and um, these people are expecting they're going to be cured by the apostles because they know that the apostles have this power from God and given by our Lord. And the Catechism says this is, should be your attitude in receiving extreme unction to have the faith to believe that God can cure you through the power of the sacrament. Um, but... Now we're in a worse position because, uh, and, and, and we say, why, why are there so few miracles in our time? There's still, uh, still obviously miracles, but they're, they're not a lot. Um, and that's because we're not just at a time when faith has waned. It's just like we're in a state of apostasy of Christian nations. So we, uh, faith is needed. Faith is needed to, for miracles to happen. Our Lord is always saying, it's your faith. Your faith has made you whole, right? Um, so this sacrament 
depends, the, 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 this effect of the sacrament relies partially on the faith of those, of the priest giving it and of the person receiving it. So this is um, the conclusion of our treatment of extreme unction. Um, we're going to go on to holy orders next, but if you have any questions. You were saying that the, uh, the uh, attachment to sin re remains fine after the, after the next uh, sacrament. Right. After penance, after we can go and confess a sin in, in the sacrament of penance. But not an extra we, Well, extra unction will remove not just the sin, but the effects as well. And and, okay. and help you, including that attachment. Okay. Yes, um, because its purpose is to get you ready to see God. So it has to remove everything that's going to keep you from God. And that, that's going to be the guilt of your sin, the punishment due to your sin. So you're going to have to, you still have to pay for your crimes, right? You may be restored and you get out of jail, but you still have to pay for your crimes. Um, and also then that that criminal nature where we like sin, we have this tendency towards sin, and to rectify our intellect, our will, um, our passions. Very uh, yes, yes. What a blessing to have this sacrament. What a gift of God, a, a blessing from God to where, you know, I mean, he's taking, taking away some of the um, hard effort that's necessary on our part at the end of our life, um, shortening our time in purgatory. Yeah, um, um, that's very comforting. Can you have this more than once? Yes, yes. You can have it more than once um, because the recovery of bodily health can be an effect of the sacrament. It's precisely because you, you can receive your health back that you can take the sacrament again. So, so see, whenever you have a situation uh, where where the person receives extra unction, they get better, and then some time passes, and then they fall back into a state of sickness. Then they're able to receive the sacrament again, another time. Oh. The cremation. Cremation. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sorry again. This is what people do. Even in the church, uh, yes. Uh, I'm just asking practical questions. Uh, yeah, it doesn't fit with cremation. I mean, if you you are cremated, it about the effect of. of, of yeah, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't. I mean, you you consider this body has been anointed with holy oils. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's received the waters of baptism. It's received the the Eucharist so many times. Um, it's received the holy oil of confirmation, the sacred chrism. It's been marked with the sacred chrism. It's been anointed with the holy oils of extreme unction. I mean, it's been a temple of the Holy Ghost. Why Why would you burn it? Why no, would you destroy I, it? I, I yeah. fully agree. I'm just <laughs> saying that even among Catholics, that's yeah. a boring practice. Because it's now permitted. It's now permitted. And so the new new canon, canon law permits it. So. All right. Let's uh, say a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Our Lady, help of Christians. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Welcome.